Welcome to worship. What is it that we worship? Does that question shock you? It's one we ask far too often. Oh God, of course, you say, me too. And yes, when we gather like this, virtually or in the flesh, our intent, all of us, is to worship God. But that answers the question, who, not what? It's actually the right answer to the wrong question. Our worship so often has us asking and answering the question, what is God? Instead of carrying on the conversation that God has started and the two questions that are really at the heart of worship, who are you and who am I? We bring our preoccupations, our understandings to this meeting. We pile up attributes and multiply them by infinity. Glory, majesty, might, dominion, power, and other top-notch things besides. Yet there's one thing that we say about God that goes deeper than any number of attributes or any amount of deeply traditional, powerful, beautiful, and yes, true language elaborating our understanding of God. It's this. God is love. That's what and who God is. Turn to God. Listen for God. Listen to God. Talk to God. Know in Jesus Christ that God is gentle because God is love. Do that and it won't just be me you'll hear saying, welcome to worship. Lord, you have been our refuge from one generation to another. Before the mountains were brought forth or the land and the earth were born from age to age, you are God. You turn us back to the dust and say, go back, O child of earth. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. Return, O Lord, how long will you tarry? Be gracious to your servants. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning, so shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. May the graciousness of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper the work of our hands. Prosper our handiwork. Let us worship God. Gentle Father God, how gentle is your power who made all things, whose purpose is fulfilled in love. Gentle Lord Jesus, how gentle is your authority, inviting, not coercing, 
offering, never forcing, healing, never wounding, forgiving, never casting out those who come to you. Gentle Spirit of God, how gentle is your work, shaping with endless patience the world that God has made, the souls whom Christ has saved, the paths of those who seek, the stubborn hardness of the world, which struggles to reject the love of God and fails. Forgive us our ungentleness, Lord. Forgive us our brusque, anxious self-assertion, our easy assumption that it is only pushiness that prevails, our despair of the very notion that the world, made by a gentle God, might pay any attention to gentleness. Set us free from fear that stops us from being gentle. Let us hear Jesus' soft, arresting command, made always as an invitation, follow me. Let us arise with the courage of those who have met in Jesus the authority of the Son's urgent compassion, the challenge of the Father's boundless love, the quiet, powerful rush, understated like a mighty wind, of the Spirit's creating, recreating word. Let us go into the world in the strength of gentleness to live the love of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho, and the Lord showed him the whole land, Gilead as far as Dan, Naphtali, the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, 
all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Negeb and the plain, that is, the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. The Lord said to him, This is a land of which I swore to add Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. Then Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. At the Lord's command, he was buried in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows his burial place to this day. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired and his vigour had not abated. The Israelites wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the period of mourning for Moses was ended. Joshua, son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. And the Israelites obeyed him, doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequalled for all the sights and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt. Against Pharaoh and his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Now here's something that you might not know. Computers can get indigestion, but there's a cure. Don't worry if you don't really know anything about computers. This isn't a difficult idea. Computers eat all sorts of things from the internet. They do it all the time. Well, eat isn't really the word. Download is what we really call it. And sometimes they eat, download things that don't agree with them. And, please excuse the technical language, they go all funny. But there's something you can do. There's a thing called a restore point. And at the click of a mouse or trackpad, you can just get your computer to go back to it. Back to a point where it ate the program that didn't agree with it. Back to before things went wrong. Back to when everything was working properly. Back to when things were the way they should be. Everything you'd want to keep is still there. Everything that was causing problems is gone. Problem solved. Moses was Israel's restore point when things went wrong. When things went aglay, funny isn't the right word, because often it was very serious. Moses was Israel's restore point when Israel drifted away from her right relationship with God, downloaded some incompatible programs and wasn't working properly. Moses was Israel's restore point, going back to Moses, to the Exodus, to Sinai and the law. That was Israel's restore point. That was the point at which everything had been the way it should be in Israel's relationship with God. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. That was the authority that Moses had, not that of a great orator. He was a terrible speaker, and Aaron had to speak for him. Not that of an autocratic commander. The people often grumbled about him. Behind his back and to his face, never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. 
The authority of truth, even difficult truth, truth plainly told. The authority of persistence and inner strength. The authority of one who could be furious with his people, but never gave up on them, and stood up for them, and spoke out for them with God. The authority of a rock-solid relationship with God, depending utterly on God in everything, yet taking adult responsibility for everything before God. That was Moses' authority. That's why Moses was Israel's restore point. To get back to Moses was to get back to Israel's relationship with God, just the way it should be. What authority does gentleness have in our world? Doesn't even the question sound silly? The idea that gentleness and authority can be put together like that in one sentence. Authority surely is the capacity to tell people what to do. The status to issue orders, not to make requests. The office held or even just the personal air of command that lets one say to people, do this, do that. Why does gentleness come into that? We don't live in a gentle world. Assertiveness, pushiness, looking out for number one. Not many people like those attributes, but people feel that that's the way the world works. Perhaps it touches us all at times. Perhaps it touches us all and we stop noticing until suddenly gentleness appears and stops us in our tracks. Gentleness isn't the same as softness. It isn't the same as not being strong enough to stand up for yourself. There are times when gentleness is stronger than a brick wall. Pushiness runs into it and is stopped dead. Does that ring any bells? Didn't the nameless prophet of the exile speak of the strong servant of the Lord like that? He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. And didn't Matthew quote that when he was talking about Jesus? 
Our language is often far from gentle. Sharp, ungentle words are meant to hurt, but they hide vulnerability, they don't show strength. A duel of words, a battle of wits we call it, and the witticisms wound, and there is a winner and a loser. You can dish it out, but you can't take it. That's the victor's taunt. Gentleness is greater than any of this. Gentleness is strong enough to take it and strong enough not to dish it out. And as with words, so with actual violence. Do you remember the garden of Jesus's arrest? And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, that's enough. Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Gentleness is as tough and strong as love because the roots of gentleness are in love. Gentleness can command. It makes a demand and sets us free to obey or not to obey. Come with me and I will make you fishers of men. So the fisherman got up and left it all and followed. Nobody made them do it. Jesus didn't make them do it. Yet they couldn't say no. So Paul says to the Thessalonians, we were gentle. You remember us for that. We were gentle, as Jesus Christ is gentle. That's where our authority comes from. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak, not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us.
all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell of this religious leader whose story you're about to hear with his question, which is the greatest commandment? And they all do something very different with it. We probably remember this little episode best in Luke. The lawyer asks his question, which is the greatest commandment? And he gets Jesus' answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength and your neighbour as yourself. And he, seeking to justify himself, close but no cigar, he spoils it all with his follow-up question, which is, so who is my neighbour? Oh, so close. And what he gets is the parable of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus questioned to him, who was neighbour to the man who fell among thieves? It's kind of obvious, isn't it? So the clever lawyer skulks off. In Mark, the same chap asks the same question, but it's obvious that he's serious about it. He really wants to know. And he's clearly deeply impressed by Jesus' answer. You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbour as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And Jesus tells him that he's not far from the kingdom of God. This is a chap who came to see what Jesus was all about and he got it. Matthew's different again. Same man, same question, same answer. But no response, no reaction, because Jesus goes straight on to ask a question to the Pharisees behind him, Jesus' real interrogators. Now, this question is really Matthew's question. It sounds arcane and irrelevant to us. Who is the greater, David or the Messiah? But for Matthew, and the way Matthew wants to tell the story of the gospel, it's the question. This isn't Jesus asking, is the Messiah going to be more or less important than David was? This is Matthew asking, who is it whom we meet in Jesus? When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. As we said, somewhere in that convoluted last bit about David and Psalms and the Messiah, this is Matthew asking, who is it whom we meet in Jesus? Who is it whom we meet? Well, more than David because of an obscure argument taken from one of the Psalms, but also more than Moses, because Jesus just authoritatively boiled down the whole of the law that Moses gave Israel to just two commandments. The Sermon on the Mount, 17 chapters previously, insists on the same thing. It has Jesus repeatedly saying, you have heard it said, but I say to you, that's an astonishing thing to say. This is the faith of the church. What confronts us in Jesus Christ is God's demand, God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness, God's love. For Matthew and his persecuted little Jewish Christian church, maybe somewhere in Syria, Jesus Christ is as ultimate and as decisive as he is, or should be, for us. 
That's our identity as Christians. Jesus defines who we are. To be true to Jesus means to live out his gentleness and his love. To forgive more times than we can count and not to count anyway. To turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile. It means actually to live as though there is nothing more important in our lives than to love God with all our heart and strength and to love our neighbour as ourself. Because there isn't. This is what Paul and his companions were saying to the Thessalonians. And Paul would say it again to the Philippians. Let that same mind be among you as was in Christ. You've seen us trying to live that out. And this is what you're supposed to do. And he says it again to the Corinthians. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. It is not resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongs, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Well, where do you think he got that from? From Jesus, whom in the flesh, of course, Paul never met. From Jesus, from the stamp of Jesus and the living presence of Christ in the church. That's who we are or who we're supposed to be. And that means you. And it means me. And we fail. And we fall short. And we sometimes download iffy stuff, as it were, and go all funny like computers. And the Israelites went with Moses. And that's where we need to click on system restore ourselves. And we go back to our restore point. And we know who he is. Jesus is what we're supposed to be like. Jesus is who we're supposed to be like. And as we said at the start, it goes so much deeper than the what questions. This is about who God is. God is love. And this is who we are, who we are meant to be, and how we are meant to live. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself.
Let us pray. Ever-living and ever-loving God, we thank you for your presence with us, for sending your Spirit to guide us. Come, Holy Spirit, and transform our societies. Help broken people find healing, lonely people find love, bitter people find peace, fearful people find hope. Come, Holy Spirit, and transform our world. Help our leaders bring renewal, to speak truthfully, to heal and not divide, to hunger for justice, and in so doing meet the hunger for love felt by so many. Spirit of the seasons, of beginnings and endings, we pray for all in our world who must face difficulty. For those facing the loss of work and of financial security, show them their best pathway through the days ahead. For those facing the loss of life of their own or those dear to them, may you be especially present to them. Spirit of the seasons, of beginnings and endings, we pray for all in our world who face no difficulty. For those who are cheerful, deepen their joy and quieten their spirit. Then let their happiness infect us all. Come Holy Spirit, break us, melt us, mould us, fill us. Fill our lives with your presence so that more and more every day all that we do and say and hope will be an act of worship to you and an expression of love to others. And hear us as we say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us, us this day our daily bread. bread and, and forgive us our debts, debts as we forgive our debtors. debtors. And, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. evil. For, For thine, thine is the kingdom, kingdom and, and the power, and, power and, and the glory, forever and ever. ever. Amen. Take my yoke upon you, says Jesus, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You who are loved so gently, Go gently into the world. Love God as you are loved and your neighbour as yourself. The blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen.